Dr. Rick Wallace dropping in on you. Uh, we are here to talk about a topic that I have received a number of requests uh, to discuss and uh, with hopes of bringing some level of lucidity to the topic and the topic is critical race theory. What is it? What is it not? What's the big stir about it? Uh, my big question is, who are the people who are afraid of critical race theory and why? Um, there was a few comments over the last week, even on the radio show that I was listening, a radio talk show I was listening to, where people accused Kamala Harris of saying that she didn't want critical race theory in schools because of how uncomfortable it would make little white kids and when i heard it my initial response was well little black kids have been made uncomfortable uh for literally decades uh over a century after the freeing of slaves quote unquote the quasi liberation of slaves in 1865 uh we have uh, a consistent uh bombardment of policies laws uh, social constructs and the like that definitely uh, did not make young black children feel comfortable in the educational environment. So, but what, what I did is I decided, you know, anybody who knows me and who has followed me for any time is completely aware of the fact that I have absolutely no love for Kamala Harris, not in the slightest. But my thing is about facts and truth. So I wanted to verify before I start talking on it and going in on it and uh, whatever, I wanted to verify I have not been able to confirm that is what she said. What I did find was actually something to the contrary and I have to be honest and upfront about what I found because to me, uh, credibility is hard to maintain and sustain in a world where everybody's looking for you to slip up and say something so they can find an inconsistency, uh, so they can uh, discredit you. So, uh, in the in the in the sense and state of fairness, I'll read what she did say in an interview earlier this year, when asked about critical race theory and r whether racism and 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 uh, I think also sexism needed to be discussed. Uh, among students and in classrooms in as it pertains to the history of this country. Her response was that it is absolutely critical that we teach our children the truth about the history of our country in its best moments and in its worst moments. Um, and she said, if we are ever to go forward in, our, uh, in a way that we learn from our history and not repeat mistakes, we must know what those mistakes have been. We must know those tragic moments happened and that we can ensure th so that we can ensure that they don't repeat themselves. Now that was a quote from her. Now again, that was early in the year, and you know how politicians flip flop. So again, I'm not denying that what someone said, she said on the View. And from what I understand, that was a big issue with that interview anyway, and it didn't go off the way that they were hoping it uh, would. So I don't know what the total thing is, but I know that I did as much research as I want to do on it to try to find it, and I could not find it. And so I decided to um, move forward with the conversation, but lead in with that because that is sort of the idea. Now, the reason why it caught my attention by Kamala Harris because uh, Democrats have a tendency to push the notion, to trigger the notion by using the word racism. So the idea that racism is being discussed is immensely uh, important to them. They want blacks talking about race. They want the race uh, card to be out front and center because that's what they use to trigger and manipulate and control. Uh, it's how they play the game. So in essence, um, where you see the most resistance when it comes to critical race theory is on the GOP side where they are in a full blown mode of pushing the idea for 2024 that America is not racist. Um, now, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about critical race theory. And in a moment, we're going to delve into it from a very specific and specified conversation. Uh, 
it's going to be removing emotions and getting a true understanding of what it is, what it isn't, how it operates, uh, what people are afraid of. Is it really going to be taught in schools, in high schools, and where did it come from? I'm going to introduce you some things. I have some notes to make sure I stay on point because you know me. I can get on one point and go. Uh, and so I want to keep in mind. So I have some notes and some points, and we're going to talk on those notes and points. Before I do that, it is important that I remind you that we are in the middle of a fundraiser. Uh, the way that you can give and support the work we do from research uh, to program development to community engagement from the Black Man Lead Rite of Passage Initiative, from Restoring Ghetto's Forgotten Daughters, uh, which is something my wife and I do with young black girls and young black women, uh, many of which are from uh, abusive uh, backgrounds. All of those things you can see on the site. Uh, you can either go to the site and give, or you can go directly uh, to the processor and give. The link's in there. Or you can simply, for those of you who have been following a while, or those who like to keep things real simple, you can give through our Cash App uh, account, and that Cash App handle is also in the description box toward the top. should be very easy to find. Uh, with that out of the way, don't forget, I'm in the midst of writing book number 25. Um, and this is going to be focused on the building of black wealth um, in a panoramic perspective of everything we faced, everything we're up against now, and what we must do strategically to change uh, our direction. And what I'm doing is I am accepting uh, space sponsorships where people can sponsor space in the book to pay tribute to whoever they want to. That information will also be in the description box of how you can sponsor a space. And there's no minimum on sponsorships. So someone sponsors 50 cents. That you get your name in the book and you'll get to put the name of the person or the thing you want to celebrate in the book. All right, that's out of the way. Now, what is critical race theory? Well, let's see. Let's get this out. Let's, let's just delve into it because a lot of people have been led to believe by uh, wordplay and the manipulation of politicians for the purpose of political uh, posturing and whatever, that critical race theory is just talking about racism and dealing with racism. And one of the things that I first, when I first came in contact with critical race theory as a true construct, not just as a passing word that I had heard, uh, was while I was doing research uh, to write a book probably about 10 years ago. Uh, I had heard it many times before, and I decided to really sit down when I was writing this book and look into critical race theory. And what I discovered is I had been practicing critical race theory uh, for probably 15 to 20 years before that, and I just did not realize what it was. Uh, also, uh, one of the best displays of the use of critical race theory to create a premise surrounding race was done by uh, attorney... Um, Michelle Alexander, who wrote The New Jim Crow. Now, there's a reason why she was able to do such a good job, because CRT, uh, which is what we will call it, move forward, critical race theory, CRT, uh, has its origins in the legal academy. It is where it emerged from in the legal academy. It was initially uh, discussions that surrounded how law could be used to sustain and protect and uh, perpetuate a white racial caste system because it had been believed until this point. Now, CRT has been around for decades. It's not new. Uh, it's new to a lot of people who haven't heard about it, but it's not new. It's emerged in the early 70s. I want to say as early as 1972. It, 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 it came to be a significant part of discussion. Now, from what I know about it in the legal academy, it's offered as a, an elective in law school. So it's not a required course. Uh, it's an elective course, but it is a course that has built steam over the years, and it is an examination. Initially, it was an examination of how laws and policies uh, created by uh, federal and state and local uh, entities can help perpetuate uh, racism and uh, the racial caste system, which benefits one and relegates the other to the lowest rung on the socioeconomic pole and how, how that happens. And so when you look at critical race theory, initially, 
it was really uh, focused on the legal academy, the legal aspects of how we live here. Uh, you know, from the Constitution to new policies being implemented uh, in statutes and laws and how those laws affect. So you would go back and say, OK, while most people are trying to say it's about the racist history of the United States in the sense of what happened in Jim Crow, what happened in convict leasing, what happened in the black codes where uh, blacks weren't allowed to own businesses, own property, and weren't allowed to take certain jobs within certain industries which were reserved for whites. Those are literal laws. So the thing is, we knew that uh, convict listen existed. We knew that the black codes existed. We knew about Jim Crow segregation. We knew about redlining. Uh, we knew about all the difficult things that our people have had to fight against in the quest to gain uh, footing uh, in a socioeconomic environment to gain footing in uh, the political arena, to gain footing in the realm of education. But how was it happening and why was it happening are the questions that should be at the front, forefront. And so uh, critical race theory was there to examine it, to interrogate the policies, to literally examine them or cross-examine policies and say, why were they in place? How did they impact blacks? How did they impact whites? Is there a consistency in the policies that produce a consistent result in both groups? And what you find when you start to examine critical race theory is that there were definitely laws and statutes and policies within companies, within organization that benefited whites while uh, having a negative impact on blacks. And ultimately, as I stated earlier, relegating blacks to the lower rung on the totem pole. Well, uh, first I want to uh, introduce uh, the people like um, um, here we go. I want to introduce some people to you. Probably the most popular name um, that pops up when you start talking about critical race theory is Derrick Bell. And then probably Kimberly Crenshaw. Kimberly Crenshaw is actually the person who coined uh, the phrase critical race theory. But there were a number of other people who played a role in its early development, including Cheryl Harris, R Richard Delgado, Patricia Williams, Gloria Ladsden, Billings, uh, Tara Yoso, uh, and a, a number of others. So it wasn't just Derek Bell or Kimberly Crenshaw. While you're going to hear a lot about their role in it because they were the vocal parts, Kimberly like I said, is the one who coined the phrase Patrick has, I mean, not Patrick, Derek has probably been the most vocal and the most visual. And so people tend to associate critical race theory with them and them alone. But it was something that was quite expansive and highly comprehensive. And so when I think about it, I would, when people talk about it being put in school, I think that no one has ever really, that I am aware of, no school district has ever thought about high school or uh, K through 12 school district has considered truly implementing critical race theory into their curriculum because of the expansive and comprehensive nature of critical race theory. I think that what happens is it's being used as a lightning rod for political posturing as election dates roll around to, to, uh, mobilize conservatives and moderates who may feel that their children are going to be uh, put in uncomfortable situations. And so the idea is it's going to um, inflame uh, a large part of, part of the population against whites. And the truth of the matter is it's simply pointing out the truth. And so you have to ask yourself, what is the truth? So let's again look into it. What is it? Uh, I'm going to give you a definition that I've paraphrased and put together. CRT is a practice of interrogating the role of race and racism in society that emerged in the legal academy and spread to other fields of scholarship. And this is important that as a general rule, we're talking about something that digs so deeply and examines behaviors and policies and things so deeply that it has remained primarily debated and practiced within the world of scholarship. It is within the legal academy, the educational academy, and uh, the uh, 
Academy of Psychology and so forth, where we're starting to examine the outcome of behaviors and policies over the course of the last 155 years. And so that is something that when people start talking about critical race theory, that's what it is. It's a true examination and interrogation, primarily and initially of policies within the legal academy. Then it became an examination of policies within the educational uh, environment. Uh, what's determining where, school, where, where, where children attend schools? Uh, can it be traced down and held within the confines of race? Even when race is not mentioned, can you use other means and mechanisms to create a situation in which most blacks will be still held into one area and whites in another way? So in other words, while uh, educational segregation is a federal crime and illegal, are there ways to still keep schools segregated without calling it racial segregation? And the, and, and, and the answer to that is obviously yes. I've written on it, and there are many ways that it's done within the school system on, a, on an individual level with students, and I've written on that uh, with uh, a position paper on the disproportionality of special education referrals for young black males in, in, car, in uh, comparison to uh, white males or even uh, black girls. And so you find out that, yes, there is a policy in place. There is a practice in place. There is a systematic pattern of hurting black boys through school um, in a way that it alienates them from the educational process and increases their risk for dropping out, which we know uh, through study increases their risk from being becoming incarcerated by at least five times. So. There's a practice in place, but we can go back to segregation. Not only are we still highly segregation, segregated within the educational community, how schools are funded are still funded in a way that those within impoverished and property uh, poor uh, communities don't get the funding that schools that are in more affluent areas. And that's because the way that the funding is set up is to fund it set up off a of property value. So then the more uh, expensive or the more value I have in my property, the better education my child gets based on how they describe education. Again, I don't see academic attainment as a end all be all for education. I don't believe that you define education within the narrow constructs of academic skills. I think academic skills are important, but I think that we need to expand the very definition of what becoming educated is. And I have defined edu holistic education as the empowerment and preparation of a young individual to grow into an adult and be capable of not only competing in a world that is inherently hostile towards them, but to win. And so that means they need to be educated in their history. They need to be educated in their heritage. They need to be educa educated in their self-identity, their self-concept, their self-worth, because that leads to self-confidence. And self-confidence is what guides the course of their behaviors, their actions, their expectations, and how they move in life. So it begins with teaching them who they are. So you can give them all the academic skills you want to, but if they don't know who they are, they will still always look to someone else to tell them. The beautiful thing about knowing who you are is you stop looking for other people to define you. Define you. So in essence, you can look in the educational realm and see it. You can see it in the financial uh, scope of what's going on. There's still practices in place right now that uh, literally impact who can get funding for what. There's a reason why it's extremely difficult to develop uh, impoverished areas to improve lifestyles and living for the people who live there. So it opens the door for gentrification. Why? People come in with dollars. So what do they do? They actually create situations that drive the property value down even worse. So there, there, there's always something that comes in. I know in one area in Houston, they sit up a gravel pit like right next to the freaking community, which was a part of driving it down. Then they allow crime to escalate. They uh, stop monitoring, stop protecting, stop patrolling. They allow crime to rise, drives the property value down. What happens after it's driven down so low? People come in and buy for pennies on the dollar. Then what happens? They start to build things that drive the property value back up. 
then what happens? Well, as the property value dr is driven back up, uh, people who actually own property in the community that has always that have always been a part of the community are struggling now to pay the taxes on properties that are exceeding the value that they've held historically, and they don't have the income to pay the property taxes. And in many instances, they lose the property. And the few that remain behind that can are now encompassed in a new gentrified environment where white people are now dominating in presence places that were historically black. Now, that's just in that one area, but critical race theory doesn't look at the emotion. Now, what we need to also do is we need to go back to the brilliant mind of Neely Fuller Jr. and look at something that he said that I think everybody who wants to have this discussion about race has to sit up and be aware of uh, this assessment by Neely Fuller Jr. He said that until you understand um, waste racism, he, he, he puts it this, I call it white supremacy racism. He says uh, racism, white supremacy. Uh, same thing. Uh, but he says, until you understand racism, white supremacy, how it works, how it moves, how it operates, everything you think you know or everything you know will only confuse you. And I think that a lot of people see racism in this country through the lens of bigotry. And bigotry, it, while in and of itself, can be fueled, I mean, can be sustained and supported by racism, but racism isn't necessarily bigotry. Bigotry is individual hatred. Bigotry is what one person can do to you. Racism is an institutionalized system, systemic uh, function through which everything operates. This isn't about a bunch of people who are moving around and purposely looking for ways to screw black people. This is about a system that was initially designed to protect the interests, the wealth, uh, the property, and the sanctity of whites. And it, it, in, in doing so, it has systemically and automatically relegated blacks to the bottom pits of existence in this country. And yes, there are blacks who have thrived. And yes, there are blacks who have risen. And yes, there are blacks who have done some remarkable and exceptional things. That's to the credit of blacks not to the credit of the system. And you have to understand that. But what they'll tell you is racism doesn't exist. You had a black president. No, we had a interracial president who had been handpicked by those who were in control of the system, had been walked through from early stages, I mean some 30 years, to get to this point and fast-tracked through the political process uh, to be put in that position for the expediency of things that need to be done at the time. Now, the average person isn't going to understand that because they're not looking. I, I tip you all the time. We have had some of the greatest minds from Asa Hillier to John Henry Clark uh, to James Smalls to uh, Dr. Amos Wilson to uh, Dr. Joy DeGru, uh on down the line, uh, Dr. Naeem Akbar, and on down the line, and they've given us just tons of information about who we are, what we've been through, what we face, what we're going through. And I think it's important that we read that, but I think also we need to study our enemy a little more. We need to study those who are opposed to us, those who we are going to have to find a way to move through or move around in order to get what we want. It's great to know who we are. It's great to know how we've been handled, but we need to know how they think. We need to know how they operate. We need to know their systems and study their systems. One of the things I've done and one of the reasons why I can present strategies, one of the reasons that I can operate and talk about things with confidence is because the amount of time I've spent researching, not just my great ancestors and what they had to offer, but how the enemy was thinking simultaneously, how the enemy was operating. One of the books that I advise to anybody, if you're really going to truly understand world power and geopolitics and how it's impacting us here locally or nationally, then you need to read The Grand Chessboard by Brzezignu Brzezinski, probably the most foremost, the greatest political mind, or at least the greatest political mind that was able to be functional on stage. 
and the role he's played since the early 1970s when he was uh, tasked with by David Rockefeller to start the Trilateral Commission and how everything has played out since then. And so many things that we have issues with socially come out of that particular political move. How we actually uh, positioned ourselves to become a world power, the singular world power for a number of years before now being threatened by China. Um, but a singular world power for a number of years after we were able to topple the Soviet Union, and that was done by a Cold War. Cold War meaning no war, no no shots were being fired, no no missiles and bombs, but there was a conceptual, philosophical war going on on between communism and capitalism. And the, if you really study history, what you'll find out is until the U.S. moved into uh, the position of being a world power, there has never been a world power outside of Europe. Rome, Greece, all that stuff is that 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 east you can go back maybe <clears throat> you know I wouldn't necessarily I, I would consider Egypt a dynasty after dynasty after dynasty and uh Nile civilizations but that wasn't world powers they were dominant in that region uh but world powers were uh from before Greece, um, you know, you start looking at nations that were conquering nations, so to speak, and dominating nations, all the way up to uh, probably the most prevalent was Rome. You had Greece and then you had Rome. And eventually they topple and then you come back and you start looking at Germany and then the, uh, the Soviet Union and then the U.S. And now China's rising up. And China would also be one that would, you know, be a part of Asia. So not uh, the the uh, traditional European central thing. And a lot of that reason that has to be is the strategic position and movement of the Middle East. The Middle East has always played a central role in how things have went. So there's a reason why beyond the religious reasons that everybody talk about. There's a reason why Israel is so prominent and everybody has a stake in what happens to Israel. There's a reason why everybody is interested in Iraq, Iran, uh, uh, Afghanistan, and Turkey, and all these other places in the Middle East because they play a major role in geopolitical and global dominance. And you have to understand why everybody's invested in that. You have to understand why everybody's always interfering in what goes on in the Middle East. But again, you'll learn all that if you read the grand chessboard, but it's interesting to see how that plays out. So now you can come back and understand why, how they think and compared to how we think. We think emotionally. So we're thinking about what the person at work said to us. But what you're not thinking about are the policies within the company that are going to actually protect that person, the policies in the company that allow for the microaggressions that you experience as a black person within the company that, again, has a negative impact on your mental health, uh, that can also then have a negative impact on your physical health, that can then have a negative impact on your life expectancy. All of these things have this cascading effect, but it begins with policy. It begins, see, there could be no situations in which there was a great disparity in how schools were funded and how children were educated without there being laws that set it up. And see, the laws don't have to say, well, we're going to take this and make sure that whites are going to have this. No, the law simply set up and said, we're going to set up something in place that uh, automatically protects the one with the wealth because it will bene be benefited by the ones with the wealth. So in other words, it says uh, the way they're going to protect your wealth is you're going to invest your wealth back into your community and into the schools within your community to ensure that your children are better, ed better educated than other children. Your children are going to have a safer environment than other children. Your children are going to have direct access to ac uh, parts of academia and the educational academy that other kids simply won't have access to. That by having knowledge of things that other kids don't have knowledge of. There are just certain things that are not being discussed in the average inner city school that are being discussed in some of these academies. And you gotta understand how that works. Well, okay, the, the laws say, well, the way we're gonna fund the schools is through tax, uh, uh, property taxes. Well, if I live in a $500,000 home, 
then I am going to be able to pay taxes on that $500,000 property and that's going to go towards the school. Whereas in, in many communities, most people don't have homes. And in an inner city and impoverished communities, those homes are in many times less than $100,000. And in many times, there are a great deal of multifamily dwellings, apartment complexes, where there are no property taxes being paid. Not by the people who live there. So then you have to understand that what goes into the schools in those districts will not be the same thing that goes into the schools of other districts. That is a policy interrogated by CRT. Critical race theory examines that. What something that uh, Michelle Crenshaw uh, hammers home, hammered home a lot was that CRT shouldn't be viewed as a noun. It should be viewed as a verb. It is an evolving practice. It is a behavior. It is the constant integration of systems, policies, and laws and how they directly support a racial caste system built to sustain whites while relegating blacks to the lower rung on the socioeconomic ladder. And so it is immensely important to understand when we talk about critical uh critical race theory, here's a note that I wrote. It says, critical race theory critiques how the social construction of race and uh, an uh, excuse me, institutionalized racism helped to perpetuate a racial caste system that relegates people of color to the bottom tiers of socioeconomic experiences. It's systemic. It's not about how you feel. It's not the white man calling you the N-word. It, it, it's not the little microaggressions. Those are simply emotional and mental behaviors and the idea of superiority that's ingrained in whites because of the environment and the system that they are reared in. The problem isn't in that. The problem is in the fact that just by existing and following the laws, the rules, and the policies that are currently in place, they are protected. Their privilege is covered and protected systemically, legally, in policy. And so critical race theory is that thing that says, let's look at it beyond the surface. It is to examine how each law can or cannot. See, that used to be a point when this first emerged uh, in the legal academy, there used to be a point where everybody considered the law to be objective, meaning that the law didn't play favorites, that the law would be the same for each individual regardless of race. But we know that not to be true. We know that not to be true. So then we had to look and say, okay, how can laws on the surface seem to be objective and non-racially motivated, but underneath be so? Crime Bill of 1994, prime example. A law that gives greater punishment to cocaine in the form of crack than cocaine in its pure white form. So the person in the pure white form gets two years, the person in, with, 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 with crack gets 20. Disproportionate sentencing. Same crime, you, you're in the possession of a Schedule II drug. And if you don't understand, drugs are put on a schedule scale to determine their medical uses. A Schedule One drug has almost no medical use whatsoever. It's just, it's, it's dangerous and it is no medical use for it. So um, then Schedule Two drugs are your drugs where in certain forms they can be useful. Um, and, it, and I used to wonder why is cocaine a Schedule Two drug and not a Schedule One drug? Because if you actually look at some of the drugs they give our kids like Ritalin, Vivax, Concerta, uh, uh, Norvask and things of that nature, those are actually one molecule off from being uh, cocaine, literally one chemical molecule from being cocaine. They are literally stimulants that they give kids with hyper, uh, uh, ADHD, uh, attention deficit hyperactive disorder. They give it to them because people who have uh, that type of brain activity uh, has a counter response to a stimulants that the average person has. The average, per average person takes a stimulants, they get wired. 
a person with ADHD takes a stimulant, or a person who has the, the, the brain activity and behavior of a person diagnosed uh, as ADHD will actually calm down. But you're drugging. That's a psychotropic drug. Regardless, it's a psychotropic drug being given to kids. Now what you'll find out is the vast majority of kids in schools who are being designated as oppositionally defiant, as ADHD, as learning disabled, and, and, and other things, especially oppositionally defiant and ADHD, which can be medicated, are young black boys. That's not by accident. That is about social policy merging with legal and state policy. And it, when you see it inconsistent, there's this thing in science we call statistical, statistically significant. Something When something is or statistical significance, when something is st statistically significant, what it says is it's happening at a rate that cannot be explained away by coincidence, meaning that there has to be a driving force behind it. There has to be something causing it, and it's consistently taking place. And for something to consistently take place over and over and over again, somebody has to be creating that force. So you have to take away arguments. Can the argument be that, see what, what, what for so long was done is the argument was made that blacks are simply intellectually inferior and that whites are inherently intellectually superior. This is an argument being made as late as the 19, early 1980s. And that's kind of how I ended up in this whole journey of mine. My 11th grade year, 1985, I am sitting there uh, watching the Phil Donahue show, and there's this young black woman, a uh, beautiful black woman on there with an afro. Her name was Dr. Frances Crest Welsing, and she was on there, and she was discussing her Crest theory of color confrontation. And she was there, and she was standing there defending her uh, dissertation and her, her Crest theory of color confrontation against white uh, colleagues, uh, white people in the fields of psychiatry, uh, and she was holding her own. And that in and of itself was saying, hey, here's the final nail in the coffee of the argument for black uh, inferiority. And so I had, up until that point, decided I was going to go one of two ways. I was going to enter the world of psychology or I was going to enter the world of uh, the legal profession as a lawyer. She changed that whole thing and immediately set me on fire to be and become what I am today. Um, and through her, I found Neely Fuller Jr. Through through that through, through that, then came Dr. Naeem Agbar, then came Dr. Claude Anderson, then came Dr. Amos Wilton, and oh my God, things just began to open up. Then uh, I discovered. Um, Howard Stevenson out of uh, the University of Pennsylvania, then Dr. Joy DeGruy, and then and so many, and it's like, oh man, this is where I've got to be. This is where I've got to hang my hat. This is what I've got to make my life's work. And there I started. This is before the first book, and this is where I started. But but it was that thing. But the thing is, if you go back and you look at that, that was an argument before that, and they were using uh, erroneous. Uh, concepts and measurements and, and, and measurement components to determine uh, intellectual superiority. The IQ test in of itself isn't completely testing intelligence because that's a part of it that tests vocabulary. Vocabulary is environmental. There are certain things that white kids are exposed to on a, on a, on a level of vocabulary and grammar that blacks aren't. Doesn't mean that blacks aren't as smart. They're just simply not exposed. If you were to take a white kid and put them into an environment where the test was predominantly set up around Ebonics and broken English, uh, they would fail miserably and blacks would excel. And so that's not a level of intelligence. That's environmental exposure. I wrote a pretty uh, comprehensive uh, rebuttal to that. And now it's, it, 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 it's not the argument anymore. But anyway back to what i'm saying and i'm going to get even to more in deep in this the next time we're going to do it live so that can be a question answer uh perspective but there are a couple of people who came and sit up and said they wanted to know what critical race theory is it is uh, a practice of interrogating legal policies um educational policies statutes uh on federal uh state and local levels that 
help to substantiate a right white racial caste system and how it works. It's not simply the uh, historical examination of what has happened. It is how it was able to happen. What was in place that allowed it? So we go back and we say, okay, blacks struggled heavily after being emancipated in 1865. But let's ask the how and the why. They struggled heavily because they weren't allowed to migrate outside of the hostile area for the most part because states like Oregon had uh, slave laws that said, uh, former slave laws that said if a black person comes into Oregon for more than 30 days, they will be whipped with 30 lashing, lashes and expelled. So not very many states from the north wanted blacks there. So blacks were literally sort of kind of stuck in the very place uh, where they had experienced so much trauma. So then we look, okay, so what does that look like legally? Well, legally, what you have to understand is you go back to Jim Crow. Not Jim Crow, excuse me, uh, Reconstruction. Uh, we love to romanticize Reconstruction. Like, this is the time that the country rebuilt itself. This is the time the country restabilized and everybody got, came buddy-buddy. No, Reconstruction is actually more about the South than it is the North. Reconstruction is that point in the South in which... Um, uh, in the South, in which, um, oh, sorry, um, uh, it's okay. Oh. Thanks. <laughs> Cleaning poop came in. Um, but uh, it was the time in the, it, where the South actually started to move more closer to its antebellum roots within certain confines. So when you talk about Reconstruction, Reconstruction is the 12 years after the, uh, 1865 where the South initially through clandestine groups like the Klan started to raid and bomb and burn military, northern military installations within the South, eventually causing the North and the Union Army to withdraw from its installations, leaving blacks pretty much to, for their own. This is when the South started to reestablish policies that did not serve blacks, like the Black Codes. Now, the Black Codes were policies that said blacks could not own land, blacks could not uh, open businesses, blacks could not have jobs in certain industries. Why was that important? Why were those codes implemented? Because blacks were the skilled workers. Blacks were more skilled with their hands. Why? They had been doing all the work. So if we open up and we have to start paying people and we're paying them, and then there are other people who are not getting paid now, because see now the, 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 the profit margin is going to drop drastically. You go from free labor to paid labor and you are demanding a thing. Also, you got to understand if I'm opening an open market, my value is dictated about how important I am to you. And if you absolutely need me and I'm the only one. So they were restricted. Then there was the vagrancy laws that led to convict leasing. Vagrancy laws within the black hole said that you had to be gainfully employed. If you could not prove that you were gainfully employed over the year, you would be charged with vagrancy, which was made a felony. So being homeless and unemployed made you a felon. So now you ended up going to jail where you served as much as 12 years in prison. During that 12 year stay, you were leased back out, convict leasing, another law, back to the plantations and other whites who would have not, uh, would have generally uh, during, during slavery, had your labor for free, were now getting it for pennies on the dollar, but you weren't getting any of the pennies. So you were still giving free labor because remember the 13th Amendment ended slavery with the exception for um, imprisonment for a crime. So they simply made being black a crime. Basically, if blacks are the ones who are unemployed, if blacks are the ones who are being locked out of employment, locked out of starting a business, locked out of owning property, all the things that are immensely important to building wealth, we already have a head start. We're going to solidify the head start. We're going to lock you out so you can't pursue us because you may move faster than we move and you may close that gap. So everything that you look at now, all the way up to the wealth gap, is being examined and interrogated by critical race theory. Now, why are some people so escaped? Why, why are there people afraid of it? Because the biggest thing to me is if I've got a people convinced that the problem is over here and they never truly examine the dynamics of the problem, 
and they're consistently looking at this hand and in this hand is simply we're mishandling you and you got to convince us to treat you better because we're in control and we're never going to actually treat you better but we'll talk to you a certain way and we'll split up into two groups and one group will really at play bad cop good cop republicans bad cop democrats good cop the truth of the matter is that's the left wing and the white wing the right wing and both belong to the same bird that say that bird has been shitting on the head of black people for 400 years it's never going to stop shitting on people because that's what it does and so just because the right wing is the one flapping the hardest doesn't mean that it's operating in 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 in, in a unilateral manner it's in direct correspondence to the smooth stroke of the left wing which is telling you we got your back but actually probably screwing you worse if you actually study policies that have been put in place that have a negative impact on blacks over the last 60 years you will probably find that democrats have done more in the way of putting in policies that hurt us than republicans republicans actually leave a loophole for us to crawl through if we're smart enough Republicans actually favor businesses heavily. If you learn to operate and move as an individual business or you build yourself a small corporation, you can benefit from a lot, from a lot of the economic policies and tax policies that are pushed by Republicans. And stop thinking and worrying about what somebody says about you. Somebody calling me the N-word does not stop me from doing anything I want to do. I'm worried about what policies do you have in place. How are you legally trying to set me up? How are you legally trying to hold me off? Those are the things that I am consistently paying attention to, consistently observing, consistently studying. How do we move about in a world where there are literally little places and pockets that are designed to trip us up? And they are very carefully veiled so it doesn't reek of racism, but it's definitely a policy that benefits one group while maligning another. And so you have to understand that. So I'm going to stop it there. I mean, and like I said, it's so much more than that. But basically what we know about critical race theory is that it initiated in the legal academy roughly around 1972. And it began to expand. It became uh, a an elective course in law school uh, and it became a constant discussion and debate among scholars it e eventually emanated and moved and evolved and moved outside of the legal academy and it moved into other realms of scholarship uh, educators psychology uh, economics and now we start to see that after we are being able to examine it and review it and interrogate it and uh, anatomize it and break it down, that it actually is pretty pervasive in the U.S. So the idea that the U.S.A. is in a post-racist uh, state or era is absolutely absurd. Uh, I suggest reading Michelle Alexander's uh, book, The New Jim Crow, uh, to gain an understanding of it exactly how deep this runs so on that note look i'm going to get ready because i gotta get out of here i had to run off my cleaning guy but i think i'm okay i don't put a lot of bull crap in my trash and my office is clean so they don't have to do anything else but look we're going to come back here and we're going to do a live i'm going to try to do it on tuesday um and in this live what we're going to do is we're going to have a discussion about critical race theory. We're going to ask some questions. We're going to delve deeper. We're going to look at it and we're going to find out how we can use critical race theory to our benefit. That's my belief of why people are afraid. My, I believe people are afraid because if we start really truly engaging things where now you don't just have a few legal minds or a few uh, black scholars talking about it, you have people discussing it and starting to examine things below the surface, uh, we, we're going to uncover a lot. And that's the beginning of discovery. And in the beginning of discovery, you also initiate the process of solution. And I think that is a problem. I think that, yeah, we're going we're gonna to show your slip. We're going to show your slip. Your, ship's, your slip has been hanging for a while, but we're going to fully expose it. And that's a problem and that's a fear. But the other problem is, man, they're going to figure this thing out. They're going to see exactly how we've been doing it. And that's what is frightening. 
Uh, the idea that critical race theory is going to be taught in schools, I don't see how because of the depth and complexity of it. Uh, should we be concerned about what's being taught in school? Hell yeah, especially when you're sitting up and you're talking about uh, blacks came here as immigrants, uh, or that the indigenous people of the land voluntarily uh, moved and relocated so that the settlers could have a, a place to live. That's how we're really putting it in, and I've, I've seen this with my own eyes, so this isn't speculation, this isn't some uh, conspiracy theory, this is what I've read in textbooks. They are literally calling slaves immigrants who came here to work the land. And they are saying that the indigenous people voluntarily moved. Not talking about the Durangon, uh smallpox and the blankets. We're not talking about you killed off their food supply purposely, which it not only killed off their food supply, but also destroyed their uh, ability to clothe themselves in the winter because they would eat the bison, but they would also use the fur uh, from the bison uh, to warm them during the winter. And here you are killing it, knowing what the outcome is going to be. And we can go on and on and on about that, but that's what's being taught in school. So in essence, there's a responsibility for those of us who do understand to spearhead a movement to where we start to shed light on the truth, on how there are literally policies and laws in place that don't have a racism tag stamped on them, but definitely supports the racial caste system in which we operate. And we have to expose that. On that note, look, I'm gonna get ready to get out of here, but I thank you uh, for stopping by. Thank you guys for challenging me to come and talk about this. Um, it definitely helped me uh, in approaching the writing of a number of my books um, and how to view things and how to see things. Uh, and I'm glad that we're having a discussion about this. I think that we cannot allow it to die. I think that we have to stand up strong on it. And on that note, I'm going to get ready to get out of here. And finally, don't forget to support the work we do. Uh, go to the description box and whichever way you decide to do it, show some love. On that note, I'm out of here. Uh, I'm asking now as we push a fundraiser that you support what the Odyssey Project is doing in the inner cities, uh, especially with programs like Black Men Lead, which is a rite of passage uh, initiative, and Restoring Ghetto for, Ghetto's Forgotten Daughters, which is a program focused on helping young girls, but boys as well, suffering from childhood sexual abuse, uh, rape, molestation, domestic abuse, uh, absentee fatherhood, and so many other things. Uh, the information will be in the box. Thank you.